ways to um, rapidly increase the sort of ROI of our education and the impact on students and families' lives by figuring out how to tailor the educational message or how to retrain people for folks that need a different approach. And instead of sort of shoving all students into the classroom at the same time, we could be delivering individualized programs for every student in the nation. That's actually not a pipe dream. That's actually extremely available to us. But we're not doing it. And so I actually think that we're facing a future where we could see largely the end of poverty and the ability to, to really include or at least give the opportunity for most people to be included in a very vibrant economy. But we would have to use many of the things that we're learning now in AI and big data and apply them to the social sector. And the reason I moved to Silicon Valley is that I don't see that application happening fast or furious enough. I think that 99% of the market is going to, how can we yelp a better burrito for you tonight, Hannah, right? How can I find you a great hairdresser versus how can I match you with the right job training program? How can I find great childcare for you? Or how can I make sure your child is actually learning the way your child naturally learns so that he or she can accelerate in his studies and actually fill those knowledge jobs that are out there but are not being filled by Americans because we're not training them for them. And why do you think that is? Do you think that's just capitalism and the profits are in, in delivering me a burrito wherever I am? Or is it something about the culture of Silicon Valley where you know a lot of people do criticise it for being sort of young men catering for young men's needs? That's a great question. I think it's a combination. I mean, I think clearly the immediate rewards in terms of financial rewards are obviously seen in catering to the middle and upper middle classes. Easier to make a buck. On the other hand, from the government perspective, or certainly from the national perspective, when you think about how much money we're throwing into social services, I mean, the safety net alone is a trillion dollars plus a year. That's a lot of money. Frankly, a lot of companies could make a lot of money by simplifying and getting better outcomes. The government certainly could save a lot of money. So I do think there's actually a capitalist, quote unquote, incentive that's there, but the money is not as easy to to get at as yelping or burrito. I also think obviously, and this has been talked about by many people in the sector, but you know, Silicon Valley clearly has a diversity issue. I think it's one that it's at least starting to try to take seriously, probably only in the last year or so. And there's a lot of work to be done. And so obviously when you have creators who are creating things, they're creating things for themselves largely. And there is not a lot of representation yet. That's interesting. So I wrote a piece earlier this year on personalized education, which I think is what you're talking about when you say differentiated, using technology platforms to better understand people's learning styles, needs, purpose, let them move at their own pace. And one of the things that was interesting for me is that while it did perhaps, as you say, help people who were, you know, had less of an educational achievement background, a lot of the reason why I felt people were interested was they'd been bored at school. They'd been the cleverest in the mm -hmm. class and they hadn't got help. Mm -hmm. and, and so in a way that actually seemed the incentive for Silicon Valley to get involved in those. I think that's true. I mean, there are obviously these quirky things that happen, right? And, you know, God bless the brilliant engineer who didn't fit into fourth grade, right? And therefore needs to figure out how to help all those other kids who don't fit into fourth grade. The reality is that we also have a lot of uh, children with tremendous talent in this country and frankly all across the world who don't even have access to fourth grade, right? Or certainly in this country don't have access to a decent fourth grade education. So I don't care what the pathway is. And I do think you're right that in many cases there are engineers who, you know, they had ADD or they had other problems. They thought, wow, I could solve this. And God bless them, that's awesome. But the scope of the problem is actually way beyond what those engineers possibly experienced. And we need to get everybody involved as fast as possible. And so on the education front, as I said, there were you know, several projects up and running with Silicon Valley interest in them. Do you think that to be more widely adopted, do they need government backing? Any program that seeks to really scale ultimately has got to either get government backing or an adaptation at some point. Any educational system sort of penetration is going to have to happen with partnership through government. But I do think that it is possible to pilot 
interesting programs without the government involved. The reality is the government is involved in every sort of aspect of our daily life. And quite frankly, I personally would be concerned, especially with AI, if the government weren't involved in some of these things. I think there are real concerns about privacy and people's information. I think that there are plenty of misuse cases for data gathering, especially when you look at low-income folks. I think they're the most vulnerable and children. And so I think that in order to scale educational programs, you're going to need the government. But I, for one, say let the best of the private sector partner with the best of the public sector and let's find the right balance for the future of our communities. So education is obviously incredibly key and I know it's very early days for the lab, but what other big problems are you trying to find sort of technological solutions for? There are a lot of opportunities in using big data to figure out what's working and what's not in the social sector. So if you look a little bit at what the Ryan and Murray, the Ryan Murray Commission, which is sort of the only bipartisan game in town right now in Washington, there's real interest across both sides of the aisle in this country at a time when there's not interest across the aisle in almost anything to figure out how to invest in programs that work. And how do we use data to evaluate those programs quickly and to try to retrofit the right programs to the right people? Right? How do we actually more effectively use the dollars that we have to make sure that they're moving people up and out in poverty versus just maintaining them there? And I think big data, both in evaluation as well as sort of predictive applications, can be extremely helpful to some of the federal as well as state anti-poverty efforts. I think there's a lot of room for innovation there. I think there's a lot of room for very basic innovation on social service delivery. It's crazy that you can Yelp your burrito and you can get 50 options and they can all be scored and you can crowdsource information to get better and better information over time. But God forbid you need to find a job training program or you need to find a good childcare option for your child or you're a woman experiencing domestic violence, you have nowhere to go. You don't know where to go. There may be opportunities out there that you don't even know about because you can't do a quick Google search. Why can't we search quickly for programs that can make a difference in our lives? That seems to me like a very obvious opportunity and one that frankly hasn't been parsed in any way. And imagine if low-income people could actually not only search for opportunities, but rate them. Yeah, and you think that that would really help with accessibility because sometimes it almost seems as if these things are deliberately hidden and they're hard work to get at. I think it would help with accessibility. Yeah, and I also think 